Good evening. It's good to see everyone out again tonight. Um, I don't think there's any additional announcements from this morning, so please refer to the bulletin. I know there's a lot of sign-up sheets out in the foyer as well, so please uh, check those out and uh, refer to the bulletin for all of those. Our first song tonight will be number 180. One eighty. Come, let us all unite to sing. Number 937. 937. Five hundred. Five hundred.
Would you bow with me? Our Father, which art in heaven, again, we're grateful and thankful for this day. We're thankful for many blessings of life. Heavenly Father, as we come to you now, we realize there are those who are uh, grieving over the loss of loved ones. We ask thee, especially at this time, be with the mobs, family, and the loss of Brother Wayne. We ask thee to comfort that family as only you can. Heavenly Father, we ask thee to be with this church as we continue forward. We ask thee to be with each member, bless each member as each member makes a contribution to this church. Heavenly Father, we are mindful of the works of the church. We ask thee to be with them and bless those that, that uh, are involved in these works. Heavenly Father, we ask thee to be with the speaker of the hour tonight as he presents those things to us. And may, we, may he have a recollection of those things, and certainly may we be attentive in nature that we might grasp those things that are said and presented here tonight to us. Heavenly Father, we ask thee to continue to be with our Bible school teachers as from time to time they do the preparations for lessons. We're thankful for those lessons and the preparations and the effort that is put forth. Heavenly Father, we ask thee now to continue with us not only through this service tonight, but throughout this upcoming week and throughout life. Continue to bless us and keep us. This is our prayer in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Number 237. Two thirty seven. song for tonight will be number 924 if you'd like to mark that at this time 
924. Then before the lesson, let's stand and sing number 627. 627. Good evening. Thank Brother Hayden for leading us in our singing tonight. He does a tremendous job. And uh, over the years, from when he first started, man, we've just seen him grow tremendously uh, as a song leader. I love it when uh, I think about the fact that we have so many guys here in this congregation who do a tremendous job uh, in leading singing. I don't know if... Uh, you are aware of it or take it for granted, but we are truly blessed with the people that we have in this congregation and their ability to serve Christ. Be opening your Bible with me tonight, first to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, and then to Philippians chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 4. And, and as I was beginning to put this together for tonight, a lot of people crossed my mind. And I think about not doing what you see on the screen, how to kill a marriage, but how to be what God wants us to be, how to have a healthy marriage, a strong marriage, a marriage that thrives. When I think about things like that and where we're going with this tonight, there are a lot of people that cross my mind. Little did I know when I started this that Thursday night, Janie and I would be sitting at the Ryman Auditorium. Well, I knew we would be doing that, Lord willing, but I didn't know that uh, just as the Earls of Leicester were striking up their first tune Thursday night, I, I would get a phone call, have my phone on vibrate so it didn't go off and disturb the bluegrass music, uh, but it was Brother Don Mobs, and uh, I texted him, uh, can you text me? I'm sitting at a concert. And I had a suspicion what the message was going to be. He texted me back that his father, Wayne, had passed away. Passed away in an ideal sense. Uh, a nurse had come to see him. I think it was a regularly scheduled visit. Check his vitals. Everything looked good. He looked like he was in good shape. And Don said that he just sat back in his chair, took a breath, and died. 
And my reaction to that was, what a way to go. That's probably the way that all of us would choose to leave this life. And our time is coming, whether we like it or not. Had a conversation with my sister this morning. And if you don't know who my sister is, that's, that's Jan. And that's kind of a personal joke uh, between us. Not really a joke, because she is a wonderful sister in Christ. Several years ago, when she was our church secretary... She walked over into my office on a weekday afternoon, and I couldn't tell you what day of the week it was. And she said, there's a gentleman at the door who wants to talk to you. He says that he needs help. To those of us who preach, especially if you have been doing preaching as your life's work for any length of time at all, when you hear that, there's someone at our door who wants to speak to you. He says he needs help. You immediately roll your eyes. And you think, oh, here we go again. Because that is typically somebody there asking for money, financial assistance in some sort of way. And... Uh, those of us who have done this for any length of time at all realize that there are some very interesting and very creative stories that put, get put together sometimes as to why that need has arisen. So I said, oh, okay, show them in. And I was not excited at all. He came in and he needed help. But it wasn't financial help. He needed emotional and spiritual support that says absolutely nothing negative about him. He had just went through the death of a spouse who died after a lengthy battle with cancer. And he needed spiritual and emotional help on that occasion. I'll tell you no, no more about it than that. We prayed together. We talked. He's looking for a place to worship I said, we would love to have you here at Minerva Drive. It wasn't long after that that he became a part of our congregation place membership at Minerva Drive. I think he visited the following Sunday. His health was such that he was not able to be here very much at all. Very rarely was he able to be here. And health was never used as a crutch for missing church. Because when he was here, I will promise you, he wasn't feeling good. So a lot of you never got the chance to know Brother Wayne. We put him on our list of people to visit every Thursday morning. Our group of retired men plus the preachers uh, who go out and make visits. And by the way, guys, if you are retired and have Thursday mornings free, come go with us. We pair up. We make visits you will be a blessing to someone else's life by doing that, but I promise you, you will get the greater blessing. And that group, every month, somebody would go to see Brother Wayne Mobs. And there were some within that group who just randomly would stop by to visit Brother Wayne. And all the time that I knew him, not one time did he ever ask for anything other than friendship. And he didn't do that by way of saying, come on guys, be my friend. He gave his friendship. He gave his love. He gave his warmth. And I wonder if all of us who claim to be followers of Christ lived our lives that way. How much would that improve our life as a congregation? How much would that improve our marriages? How much would that improve relationships between people? And Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 verses 1 to 3, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, 
showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And then he goes into that great discussion of the ones that exist in Christ. A text that says so much about relationships is Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, really going through verse 11 of that chapter. I'm going to quit at verse 3. This says so much about relationships if we want to have relationships that are blessed. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but... With humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. It would be very easy for me to say that we're living in the midst of a generation that is self-absorbed, but that's probably been the case about most generations that ever come along. By the way, be here next Sunday night. Uh, Next Sunday night, there are going to be the three of us up here on the stage, Brother Joshua and I and Brother Eddie Sanders, and we're going to be having a conversation. We're having a conversation. We've got a road map, a direction that we want to go. It's going to be somewhat off the cuff. It is not going to be scripted. But we're going to be talking about where it is and how it is that we find any sense of validation, and maybe even if that is a legitimate thing to be seeking to be seeking validation, to be seeking approval. How do we go about doing that? I don't know exactly what all is going to come out in that conversation because we're not going with a printed script. But I do know one thing. If we truly want to have a life that is worth living, if we truly want to experience joy, peace, and love in this world, And if we want our marriages to thrive, rather than just to be something that we're able to endure, we need to get a hold of these very, very basic biblical fundamentals. And we need to have that goal in mind for our marriages. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4 says, in some translations, that marriage is honorable in all, and the bed is undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge In other translations, it says marriage is to be held in honor. So which is it? Well, if you you read the Greek New Testament, I believe the conclusion you would come to is that both of those are very, uh, very valid translations. It is an honorable institution. By the way, you don't get to a verb in that text until you get to the last part where he says, whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Our marriages are to be held in honor. They are to be highly esteemed. And at the same time, marriage is an honorable institution. And so do we want to have marriage relationships that thrive and that grow? Or do we want to have marriages that we're just barely able to endure? If you want your marriage to flourish, by the way, you're going to have to master some very basic, simple, fundamental principles of Christianity, of biblical morality. And one of those is what we're going to be talking about tonight, and it is this business of self. Am I going to be a selfish person Or am I going to be a selfless person? And there is obviously a difference between the two. Think with me first, if you will, about the manifestation of selfishness, how it shows up in our lives. And it can be, it can show up in our lives in a whole lot of different ways. It might be easy for us to think about the typical spoiled wife. Not all wives are spoiled. My wife is certainly not a spoiled person. She revealed to me after I became engaged to Janie, that she was really hoping that would come to pass, that I would marry her. And I asked her why. Her answer was a simple one. She is not spoiled. And I'm embarrassing her to death by telling you that tonight, But because I think you ought to be told that. 
You think about that typical spoiled wife. I know a person. This is a fact. Uh, the names will not even be changed to protect the innocent. They just won't be mentioned but a person I know went to the father of a young lady that he was in love with. He was about to propose to her, I want to marry your daughter. Can I have your permission? The father said, you can have my permission on this condition. You never live more than 40 miles away from her mother and I. I would have walked out and found someone else. He didn't. He agreed to that. He married her and he found out that he was spoiled to, he was married to a spoiled mama's brat. That is something that is purely self-focused. When I hear somebody say, and I have heard this more than once, I am spoiled in such a way that indicates they're proud of it. I'm thinking, is this somebody who is a purely self-focused person? On the other hand, you might have the man who thinks that his wife was bred and born to be his own personal valet, to wait on him hand and foot, to meet his every need, to be constantly at his beck and call. I'm concerned when I hear a man say, by the way, I am in charge of my house. Brother Clyde McCullough a number of years ago, and I can say this because he said it publicly kind of in a joking way, and we'll share that joke with you. He waltzed into our ladies' Bible class one Wednesday morning, and he said to the ladies, I want you to know that I run things at my house. And they're thinking, yeah, big boy, we know you do that. And he said, yeah, I run the dishwasher and the vacuum cleaner and the, and the washing machine. And some men are going to boast I run things in my house, and what they're talking about is they, they rule that house with an iron fist. My feelings, what I want, what I think is the only thing that gets any kind of consideration. If you look at those, and we could just really expand that if we wanted to tonight. When we, when we look at those things, we're seeing people who are entirely self-focused. And I believe it would be accurate to say that the culture in which we live is one that absolutely promotes selfishness. You think about those passages that I read in the beginning, Ephesians 4 verses 1 to 3 and Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 through 4. Especially Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3 where Paul says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. And if I'm to regard my brothers and sisters in Christ in this auditorium as being more important to me, one of those people in this congregation is this lady that sits right over here. And when I go home tonight, I need to regard her as being more important than me. We're drifting in a culture that promotes selfishness. We're looking for the cure and we're not taking the cure. We're taking the rat poison. When we listen to the messages that say looking out for self is the most important thing. Now the message may not come in those precise words but it comes with that precise meaning because we hear a lot about self love, self-validation, self-promotion in so many different ways. A preacher I've listened to a lot in recent days, he is not one of us, but for the most part, he has a very, very high respect for the inspiration and authority of scriptures as a man named Alistair Begg. He said this the other day, that preoccupation with self-esteem and self-love are nothing other than a gloss for selfishness. Think about that for just a moment. Can I give you a moment to meditate on that? Preoccupation with self-esteem, preoccupation with self-love are nothing other than a gloss for selfishness. Self-centered people who are committed to putting self first are going to have a very hard time mastering and obeying 
fundamental biblical principles. And how important are the fundamentals, by the way? Well, a number of years ago, I coached youth baseball. I didn't know a whole lot about baseball other than what I'd learned playing it in the backyard. But we tried to instill in these young boys some, some fundamental things. And at that time, uh, we had one of our local high school baseball coaches uh, worshiping with us quite a bit. And, and I'm not talking about Jason. I'm not talking about Jamie Carver. I'm talking about someone else. I was visiting him one night. And I said, what's, what's one of the biggest obstacles you face in trying to teach young men how to play the game? And, and you mind you, by the time you get to a high school baseball program, you have typically played baseball for a lot of years. He said, look, we have some people come and they're a part of our team and nobody has ever told them how to properly hold the bat in their hands. Why is that so important? Well, in a high school baseball game, We've got some high school baseball players here, not former high school baseball players. You're out there and you've got runners on base. You've got, you got runners on second and third. You need one run to tie the game, one run to win the game in the bottom of the last inning. Do you want somebody up there at the plate swinging the bat who knows what they're doing or somebody up there at the plate swinging the bat who is going to look like me? I think the answer is obvious. There are fundamentals and there are fundamental principles of living in relationships with other people. And one of those is found in that verse in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3. That we're not to do anything from selfishness. We're not to act out of empty conceit. We're to be humble in mind and we're to regard one another as being more important than self. She is more important than me. Self-centered people who are committed to putting self first are going to have a hard time obeying a principle like that. Self-focused people, by the way, are going to fail at human relationships. And selfishness is an iceberg that is going to put a big hole in your ship and take it straight to the bottom of the cold, icy waters of the deep. Self-centered people, they're the ones that pursue adulterous relationships for very selfish reasons. I've had on more than one occasion the sad situation of having to talk to somebody who is involved in an adulterous relationship, a sinful relationship. They're cheating on their wife. Brother, why are you doing this? And then they'll think about that young filly he's spending time with. And you know how it goes? It's never, well, she reminds me of what a wonderful woman I'm married to. It goes like this. She makes me feel important. What went wrong? What caused you to stray to other pastors? Well, it's never something like this. I just get such a thrill and a joy out of serving my wife and meeting her needs my needs weren't being met at home. Self-centered people, by the way, are not going to endure the necessary pain that is required to restore broken relationships. And sometimes marriage relationships get broken. And I've talked with people in, in just all kinds of messed up marriage situations. And typically, when somebody comes to me they got a big problem at home. One's been faith, unfaithful to the other. You know, I'm just kind of a first aid station. I might put a Band-Aid on here and a Band-Aid on there and a little Lecure Chrome somewhere else. Maybe a little rubbing alcohol to make them squeal a little bit. But typically I'm going to say, you know, this is above my pay grade. I need to set you up with a marriage counselor. And one of two things is going to happen. They're either going to go see the marriage counselor once, maybe twice, and then walk away from it and end up paying lawyers to get them a divorce. Or they're going to go through 
however many sessions of marriage counseling is required, and they're going to come out on the other side of that with a relationship that has been put back together. Now, in that first category where they go once or twice and then wind up paying lawyers a lot of money to get them a divorce, here's what happens. Somebody, usually the husband, will say, you know, I, I went to see that marriage counselor, and that, what that person was saying, that's just a bunch of nonsense. Or someone says to me, well, I went to that marriage counseling, and man, all they did was attack me and talk, uh, talk about what I was doing wrong. You see, what's going on is that when you get involved in something like that, you've got a painful experience. It's not a lot of fun for me to be told what I have done that has been harmful to my spouse or to my marriage relationship. I don't want to hear that. And so I shut the whole process down before it's had a chance to work. Are you with me now? I don't want to experience that pain. And so I'll walk away from that situation. And you think about Moses, who's described in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 25, this way. By faith, he chose to suffer ill treatment with the people of God rather than to enjoy the passing of pleasures of sin for a season. And people who are like that, selfish people, are never going to choose the hard path when it comes to something like that. Selfishness manifests itself a lot of ways in a marriage relationship. And brothers and sisters, I would tell you tonight, it's rat poison. It's the iceberg that will sink your marriage. I want us to move on now. If I can remember to click the thing. Okay, there's, I didn't even click it the first time. We're going to move on from the manifestation of selfishness to think about the momentum of selflessness. That's where we want to arrive tonight, to understand that we need to be selfless people. There's a biblical solution for this business of selfishness, but let me tell you something as we start down this path for just a few moments. It is going to take a lot of effort, and it's going to take some pain, because what it's really going to require is that we learn to crucify ourselves. Someone said the world's tiniest package is that person who is all wrapped up in self. There's none so empty as he who is full of himself. And if you're full of yourself, you are absolutely full of nothing. You're empty. And if you're all wrapped up in yourself, let me tell you, I don't care if you weigh 120 pounds or 350 pounds, if you were all wrapped up in yourself, that is the world's small, smallest, tiniest package. Now, self-sacrifice, this business of being selfless, is something that is absolutely fundamental to Christianity, and that's not what a lot of people want to hear today. Why are people ready to burn down this country at this very moment? You listen to what's being said. People are howling, my rights are being taken away from me. And we scream and we carry on about our rights. I've got a right to kill my baby. At what point does that business of my rights become idolatrous? Now worship me, I worship my rights. In Scripture, what you really get is a different picture. In Scripture, love means sacrifice. And please don't tell me you're in love with somebody unless you were willing to love that person. What do you mean, preacher? Well, the most memorized verse of Scripture in all the Bible is John chapter 3 and verse 16. And what does it say? For God so loved that he gave. And 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16 is very similar to that. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And if you'll notice on the screen, there's a question at the bottom of that. Do your spouses qualify? Do our spouses qualify? We know love by this. He, gave, he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Does that include my spouse? Well, certainly includes my spouse. She's a sister in the Lord as well as being my bride. Now, don't tell me 
that you're in love with somebody unless you are willing to love that person. How do you know that you love that person? It's not a feeling. You don't know that God loves you because of any feeling that you get. We have really embraced this business of feeling, and we need to push back from that just a little bit. Amen? We don't know love. We don't know the love of God because of some feeling that we get. That is nowhere in Scripture. With God and His love, the proof is in the pudding. God so loved the world that He gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. We know love like this because it just feels like we stuck our fingers in a light, in a light socket, electric socket. Now, that's not what John says. Here's how we know love. He laid down his life for us. And we need to be willing to do that for each other. How do I know that I love my wife? How does she know that I love her? Am I willing to sacrifice for her? Am I willing to give up me for her? And you need to be aware, by the way, you need to be aware of that word crucify for several different reasons. It's a very precious concept to us because Christ was crucified for our sins. He took our place and because he went to a cross, I have eternal life. Oh, that's beautiful, isn't it? But you know what he says to me? He says, yes, I was crucified for you, but here's what I want you to do if you're going to follow me. He says, son, you need to go out and you need to find yourself a cross. You need to find yourself a big heavy mallet. And you need to find yourself some spikes. And you need to get busy. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's a wonderful thing to think that Jesus was crucified for our sins. But he says, go out and get your cross, get a big heavy mallet, get some spikes, and nail yourself to that cross. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 24. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. Have I been crucified with Christ? Does my wife have any reason to believe that I belong to Christ? Has she seen that in my life? God forbid that I should glory, saving the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified to me and I unto the world. Self-sacrifice is foundational to Christianity. Go back and read our two texts for tonight, again, especially Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3, where we're not going to do anything out of selfishness. But we're going to look around, we're going to consider everybody else better than ourselves. Why should I get away from selfishness and move to selflessness? I think the very foundation of this is something that was said in the very beginning of Scripture. Where God said, let us make man in our own image, after our likeness. Then... In the next verse, he created man in his own image. And then you go to chapter 2 in verse 24. He makes the woman for the man, hands her to the man. Adam says, Eureka, wow, look at this. Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. And you know what is stated in the context of Genesis chapter 2. For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they too shall become one flesh. And you go to Ephesians chapter 5, by the way, and Paul challenges husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present her to himself, to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Husbands ought to love their own wives as they love their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. How's that the case? Well, the two become one flesh. 
No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. The best way that I can take care of me is to take care of her because I have crucified the flesh. I have crucified me. I have become one flesh with her. There's nothing more detrimental to marriage than selfishness. And nothing enhances it like people who live with a spirit of self-sacrifice. And I would suggest that we come to understand the greatest joys in life come when spouses learn to put each other first. What's the obstacle to me putting her first? I'm the biggest obstacle to that. When I live with this insane desire that all my needs have got to be met, and that's life's number one goal. I've got to move away from selfishness and allow selflessness to take over in my life and have such a wonderful momentum that everything I do is first going to be about Christ and then in my marriage be about serving my spouse. Guys, when was the last time that an action on your part was obviously an expression of sacrifice for the well-being of your spouse. Ron's got to ask himself that question. When was the last time something you did was an action, was, was obviously an expression of self-sacrifice for her well-being? And taking the garbage out doesn't count. Got to go beyond that. Selfishness, or rather selflessness. That's a tongue twister. Get those two confused. Self selflessness shows us how to be like Jesus. And when we're being like Jesus, we're living in a self-crucified way. Go back quickly to the upper room. John's account of it. Chapter 13, verses 1 through 17. You take a good look at what happened in that upper room. And I'm talking about the time where Jesus got down on his hands and knees, got, got, got down on his knees. He's going around the room. He's washing the feet of 12 apostles. Five toes on each foot, two feet on each body. What is that, 120 toes, something like that. He watched every one of them, washed every one of them. And here's what happens in marriages. There are times that I just, I don't feel like my wife deserves what I can do for her. Maybe we feel like our spouses have done something that, that just makes us not want to serve them. So think about that upper room. There's Jesus going around washing all of those feet. Did they deserve that act of service? Well, well there's Judas who momentarily is going to betray Christ. There's Peter, who not long after that is going to three times say, I don't know him. The rest of them are going to run away. Did Jesus know what they were going to do? He absolutely knew what they were going to do. And what did he do? Knowing what they were going to do, he didn't say, well, the, these fellows don't deserve this. They've cut me off from any desire to serve them to wash their feet. He got down and washed all of their toes, all of their feet, every last one of them. And I don't know that he pulled out a wire brush when he came to Judas. What are we talking about? We're talking about giving up our rights. We're talking about moving away from selfishness to becoming selfless people. Here's why that's so important. You can go back and read Luke chapter 22, verses 24 through 27, where they're having this argument in the upper room who's going to be the greatest. I may be wrong. It seems to me that washing feet comes after that. If he washed feet first and then made the application, they were surely the biggest bunch of blockheads who ever lived if they went from that to argue about which one of them is going to be the greatest. How do you become a great person? And that should never be our goal. In the eyes of God, it comes through service. Two people who love each other, neither worries about greatness. Each is concerned about the other. 
two people who love each other, my rights are never an issue. If two people love each other, they're going to gladly lay aside their rights, even their needs to care for the other. And here, here's what's going to happen. It's been my experience, my observation. Here's what's going to happen. The time is going to come when due to either physical infirmities or whatever, my needs are going to be completely removed from consideration. Or the person's not going to be physically able to meet my needs or whatever. Now, if I'm a selfless person, I'm not going to gripe about that. I'm not going to complain about that. I'm not going to go through this little pity party, woe is me. I'm going to make myself the servant of that person. That's going to come at some point in your life. Can you swallow pride? Can you love that person? Don't say you're in love with that person unless you're willing to love that person. You've got to crucify self. What's, what's the greatest principle for a successful marriage? I really think it's right there. The crucifixion of self. Let nothing be done for your own personal glory. Let nothing be self-serving, let nothing be self-seeking, but with a great sense of humility and love, consider that other person greater than yourself. If you want to fix a messed up marriage, get that cross, get that mallet, get those nails, and crucify yourself, not literally, spiritually and emotionally so that your greatest desire in life is to be your spouse's loving servant. What a great thing that is when we love each other in that sort of way. If you do that, in the words of Paul Faulkner and Carl Bakeen, your marriage can be great. It will be great. Do you have enough humility tonight to say to Christ, I need you. I need what only you can give. I need salvation through your blood. If you do and you're willing to come to him tonight, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in him, you can be buried with him. Leave that old person behind. If you've gone through that, but all of a sudden you look at yourself and you examine yourself and say, man, I'm so full of myself, I've got to do something. We can help you with that. Confess your faults one to another, pray one for another that you may be healed. The effect of fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Let your life, let your marriage, let everything you do be done for the Lord. Will you come as we stand and sing? Unable to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, it is prepared in the uh, classroom directly behind the auditorium, and you'll be served at this time. Again, it's good to see everyone here tonight. Uh, if you're visiting with us, we extend a special welcome to you and hope you'll come back at every opportunity. Our closing song will be number 839. 839.
bow together, please. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this privilege to be able to assemble on this evening to worship you and learn more about your will for our lives. We're also thankful, Father, for the opportunity to be able to fellowship together and to edify one another as we embark upon this new week. Father, as we start this new week, we pray that we'll do our best to emulate the life of Christ and to remember our mission on this while we're on this earth is to seek and save those souls that are lost. Be with us as we separate. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.